caught up with David Suzuki at his cabin on Quadra Island near Vancouver Island, where he's spending time with his wife and grandkids. Hi, David. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's lovely to have you. How's it all going out there? I'm very jealous of your of, of the life you're living out there. Well, you should be, but I'm not going to get into it too much or everybody is going to want to come out here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, I feel in many ways uh, COVID has has given me a great gift. You see, on March 13th in uh, 2020, the I was up here with my two daughters and their families, and we were kicking off spring break. And right after we got here, the lockdown came, uh, order came. Our oldest daughter uh, took off to get back to uh, Haida Gwaii, where she lives uh, with her husband, and, and uh, the islands were locked down completely shortly after she got there. But I stayed with my youngest daughter and her, uh, her three uh, young children and her husband for six months. We had six months of total isolation. And um, every morning, I was on the morning shift. I'd be up at 6. Kids came in like clockwork at 6.30, 6.45. I'd have to feed them, clothe them. And rain or shine, we're out hitting the beaches, the tide pool, the, the forest. And, uh, you know, it was just the most incredible time of my life. At my age, I had a reason to be around. I had a job, and it was the best job in the world. It was the happiest six months I have ever spent in my life. And the other thing is, you know, at my age, having been in the environmental battles all these years, you get pretty bloody cynical and and depressed about the state of the world. I've seen so much disappear in my lifetime. The kids don't know that. They've only inherited the world they're in. And so every day when I go out, when we find a snake or a frog or a salamander, it's a great discovery and a celebration. You know, we go down the tide pool and there are sand dollars and there are hermit crabs and moon snails. And the world is wonderful when you look at it through the innocent eyes of my children, grandchildren. And so I am so grateful to them for that opportunity to discover the world is still a wonderful place. And I'm more determined than ever to, to fight, to try to protect a bit of it so that they can enjoy it when they have their grandchildren. Well, that was the question I was going to ask you when you said my, yeah, my grandchildren are able to see the beauty in this life and not the cynical way that I see the world. I was going to ask, are you able to see it through their eyes? And what does that do to you? What does it look like when you see it through their eyes? Well, it's still a it's still a marvel, you know. Uh, and let me tell you, we we have a a well for our water, so you know there's a lot of pressure on it when you got all these kids and everybody's taking a bath and and washing dishes and all that. So we have to use our water very carefully, taking brown, you know, gray water and putting it on the garden or flushing toilets with it. And uh, every morning when I got up at six. I would perform my usual ritual of having a pee, but now I didn't want to use a toilet. I peed outside. Now, I love a uh, time lapse, which speeds up. You know, if you look at a starfish sped up, suddenly they're moving and touching each other. And, you know, you can see a seed sprouting or, or a flower suddenly bloom. I love that kind of uh, time lapse. But up here, we had all the time in the world. I don't have to cut out time. So as I was peeing, I could watch this bush turn from just naked branches. Suddenly little buds appear and green appears. And, you know, over time, it's suddenly this little shrub of green where every leaf is looking up at the sun and saying, give it to me. I want that sunlight. And there I pee on this on the ground. And I know that the roots there are absorbing some of that liquid and some of the nutrients and feeding every one of the, of the leaves. And, you know, you begin to look at the world in a radically different way because I'm not in a hurry. I don't have to get rid of One of the problems we face today is we're so goddamn anxious to get things done, you know, jump in a plane and we want it to be a jet so I can get there faster COVID slowed everything down and it was wonderful. And I, I got to watch the miracle of the unfolding of, of this cycle of life again, you know, and after a while white blossoms occur and suddenly in the morning I go out to pee and I hear sounds, the sounds of insects and bumblebees coming by and then 
before there's a uh, long there's a berry appearing and anyway it's uh it's, beautiful. it's just a, been a marvelous slowdown yeah. in my life here i'm bad for this i don't know if you are too but i'm bad for i'm bad for this one like looking i'm on the radio so i should say it. like looking down at the phone and i find myself this pandemic i i kind of just got fed up with it and i read a great book called how to do nothing by jenny odell and it, it sort of like changed my my perspective on 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 doing nothing that doing nothing is can be you know is is a beautiful nourishing thing and i tell you how i i can relate to you on this i remember being in the park and looking at trees, looking at the trees swaying in the wind. And I thought to myself, why wasn't I looking at this for 34 years? Like, this is better than television, man. You know, you know what I mean? Like, just watching trees. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, uh, when I was a kid, so this is back in the 1950s, there was a, a wonderful book came out called, where, where Did You Go? Out? What Did You Do? Nothing. And the book is all about how, when he was a kid, this is a book written back in the 1950s. When he was a kid, he'd go, you know, if he was going out and lying on the lawn, looking up, he was watching the clouds form and making whole stories out of the change in, in these clouds. But today he said, we're so anxious. We look out, Johnny's lying on the lawn. Oh, he's being bored. We got to rush him in and get him to do things. And, you know, it was even back in the 1950s, we were worried that we were, we're not giving our kids the time just the time to look at things going on, use their imagination or, or, or whatever, exactly as you, uh, as you say, everything's we're, we, we don't give nature or the world time, time. To, you know, I, I tell the story when uh, Rio, one of my grandchildren was born, I was pushing him in a, in a buggy. I had a, about a three kilometer route that I'd, I'd push them on and at one point, lots of joggers and bicyclists and, and walkers going by. And I suddenly said, Rio, look there. And we pushed the buggy up to this tree and right in a low branch was this giant barn owl. Now, I don't know about you, but I've not seen many wild barn owls in my life. So I'm busy snapping pictures and exclaiming to my grandson. And there must have been dozens of people that went by running or biking or doing not one bothered to stop and say, what are you looking at? Or even look at what I was busy taking pictures of. We're so goddamn busy that we don't have time to see what's going on in the world around us. I think that leads us well to the nature of things because at the same time, because it feels like taking advantage of our natural disposition towards wanting to be entertained and wanting to show us nature through that disposition. And before we talk about how you do that, I want to acknowledge that this award is a long time coming in a couple of ways. One is it's a long time coming in your long, illustrious career in media. Another, it's a long time coming because you actually got it last year and it's taken them a year to figure out how to, how to give it to you. So what does this award mean to you? Well, you know, uh, awards, I always feel, don't go to the right people, you know, uh, beginning with my my mom and dad who who taught me everything about the values that I have. And the roots of my environmentalism really lie in the fact they were married in the heart of the Great Depression. And because of that, that time shaped their values that they just pounded into the heads of me and my sisters, you know, save some for, for tomorrow, live within your means, share, don't be greedy, help your neighbors, you'll one day need their help. Uh, Work hard for the necessities in life, but don't run after money as if having more money or fancy clothes or a car makes you a better, more important person. Those are things that really I value very much because they shaped the way that I look uh, at the world around. And then through my life, you know, I've been made possible by all of the people that have, have helped me in so many different ways. I was saying to my wife today, damn it all, you know, my wife had a fall and, and injured her knee. And I said, I said, Tara, you know, you're, you're 12, 12 years younger than me. You were supposed to live way beyond me and be healthy. And I can't cook. Like, what the hell am I going to do if you're, you become an invalid? And anyway, so, you know, what does the award mean? There are just so many things that made me possible. I'm just a small part of it. But Two groups, I think, that really deserve this award as much as anything. First, the CBC, 
Thank you, CBC, for keeping me on air as long as you have. Because believe me, over the years, you know, as we've done shows on forestry, on on the pharmaceutical industry, the fossil fuel industry, the nuclear industry, they've taken a lot of shots. And they, they've had the call to get that guy off the air. And they've hung in there with me. And I'm so grateful to the CBC for that. But the other thing, of course, is we would have been dumped a long time ago if our audiences had dropped. Our numbers have kept us on air all these, these years. And I thank the Canadian public for and I, it, I love I love it when I meet people that say, my grandma used to tell me, you should watch the nature of things. Or I had a parent that that always said, hey, it's nature of things time. Let's watch this show together. I love that. And it's a, it's a tribute to the Canadian public that they felt the, the show was important and entertaining enough to hang in there and watch. Of course, it's a very uh, different world today. But, you know, uh, recently I was stunned when I heard that Kim's Convenience is, is being cancelled after five seasons. I love the show. Uh, and, uh, of course, the reason is, as lots of shows get, for after long runs, get cancelled, because you run out of things to do. The nature of things will never run out of uh, things to do. Indeed, the nature of things is more important now, I believe, than ever before. We are heading into a huge environmental crisis and nature is at the heart of this whole thing. We're never going to need uh, uh, more information about the world around us and the way that science and medicine and all of these things are interacting. The nature of things will become more relevant with time. So it's not me, it's, uh, it's the Canadian public, I think, that's recognized the value of the show. Thank you, all Canadians, for keeping us on air. I would argue, I would make a pretty good bet that these people who come up to you and say, my grandmother used to gather us around the television, uh, let's watch the nature of things, you know, the people who are keeping the show in the air, they themselves do not have PhDs in environmental science or in biochemistry or in marine biology. I want to know where your interest in explaining the scientific world, the natural world, to people without scientific backgrounds comes from? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, the person most responsible for my contribution uh, uh, as a public figure was my father. My father uh, always uh, said, you know, the trouble with Japanese Canadians is they're so humble and so shy. They don't, if you want to succeed in Canada, you have to get up and, and be ready to say something and, and be able to do it well. And he made me enter public speaking content. I don't even know if there still are such things as oratorical content, contests anymore. But he made me go into these things. And then he trained me. Like I once I had, you know, uh, my speech written out every night after work, after, after dinner, down in the basement. And I'd have to get up and give it to him. I, you'd have to memorize. If I forgot a, a word or a line, He'd be sitting there with my my speech. He'd be going through it. If I, you know, missed a, a line, go back to the beginning and start over again. And he might say, "Wait a minute, now this is the most important part of the speech. So before you get to it, you got to slow down and then use your hands and emphasize the way that comes across. Go back and start over. And do that again." And night after night, I'd end up just crying in frustration and doing this goddamn spe speech over and over. But by the end of it, I can tell you, if he woke me up at three in the morning and said, give the speech, I could give it perfectly. And um, I thank my dad uh, for that. And dad always took an interest in my education. You know, when I went away to college uh, in the States, he'd Whenever I met him, he'd say, well, what did you what did you learn in these subjects, you know? And he was always interested. And when I started in television, he always uh, would say, well, you know, I watched that show and uh, damn it all, you know, he said, I'm I only went to high school, but I'm I didn't understand a word you were saying. Now, what the hell are you trying to say? So he'd give me hell if I got. And so I always think of my father as my audience member, my loyal fan, but who would tell me in no uncertain terms if we got too fancy with our, our, our terms. So I, I thank them very much for, uh, for training me uh, along this course. 
That being said, there's been a lot of things you've had to do, which I, I mean, it's fun to kind of do the research for this interview and to see all the sort of positions you put yourself in, in the interest of putting something like this on television. I think I saw the, you wearing nothing but a fig leaf. I saw, <laughs> I saw you doing a script from, or like, you know, hosting the show while skydiving, if I'm, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, from, from midair. Is this... I mean, is this something you have to be coaxed into doing? I've, yeah, I, I've not. No, in fact, uh, yeah, the, the, the Fig Leaf show, the uh, idea for the show was mine originally. Our, our ratings were dropping because there were multiple channels opening up. And I remember coming in and, and saying to my uh, boss, Jim Murray, the executive producer, Jim, I've got a great idea for a for a show we could do. We, you know, most men know nothing about the most important organ in their body. We should do a show on the penis. And uh, he he said, Suzuki, you know, in no way he turned me down. Then we got a new executive producer after Jim retired, and uh, I told him we should do it. And right away he said, "That's a great idea." And so we did a show called uh, Fallacies. Spelled P H A L L, <laughs> which got a dynamite rating. But as we were going to shoot uh, one of the uh, intros to it, um, Halicia Glucksman, who was a publicist at the time, threw me a fig leaf and said, "Hey, Suzuki, if you can get a shot with the just wearing the fig leaf." I thought it was a crazy idea, but I was willing to try. And it just happened at that time. I was heavily into into running and just trying to get into shape. So uh, I didn't look too bad. And uh, I, I remember my daughter who was in, in high school at the time, that that shot just went, it went all across the country. I was astounded at the publicity that it got. And my daughter was mortified. She came into high school and all of the kids are going <laughs> and making fun of her because her old man was was uh, exposed as uh, a naked uh, guy. But got a, got a, lot, a lot of publicity. The time I was in the air, that was a really terrifying shot because I'd never skydived and I had never been shown. No one instructed me on what to do. Sometimes life's uncertainties hit you in the face and you have to make a decision. I was wearing a, uh, I was wearing a parachute, and all they said is, "If you fall, pull this cord." And I did the uh, stand-up. Actually, I was in a plane, and the cameraman was in another plane. We were flying parallel, and I got out on the strut and did it. It never occurred to me that I might really fall, because the whole thing was a joke. In that, while I did the stand-up on the uh, on the plane flying in the air. Then they cut to what I said to me on the same strut, but we were on the ground and the camera widened out to show that we were on the ground. And um, that was kind of a foolhardy thing uh, that we did. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, we didn't uh, actually have to pull the plug or pull the chute. There have been a number of situations that, that uh, the nature of things has got me into. The most, one of the most frightening ones was we were, went out to Hibernia to this uh, new oil field off Newfoundland. Just off the coast of, yeah, of Newfoundland, Labrador. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, there was a, a scow that was anchored that was delivering a lot of their stuff. We were on the platform and they transferred us by helicopter uh, we, they had all of our camera gear in a, in a, in nets and we just jumped onto the net. We didn't have uh, survival material, anything, just our regular working clothes. And they hoisted us over and dropped us on the scow, but the scow was moving up and down so that we had to jump off. All the, I really think that was a stupid, uh, stupid thing to do. It's, I mean, it's a really amazing thing to be able to do, right. To be able to make, Make things like drugs, make things like, um, well, plants, you know, make things like photosynthesis interesting for people. Well, you know? that's a good point. That's a good point. I've always said on the nature of things, we could do a show on the sex life of oysters and get a dynamite rating. We have become so disconnected from the world around. This, I think, is a great 
you know, the secret of success of the great natural uh, history uh, person, David Attenborough, all these years, you know, he's he's just been the representation of, of nature, taking us to the most exotic places. But you don't have to go to exotic places because we're so disconnected. And when people find out like how oysters are made or how a pearl is made, they're fascinated. And um, so well, there's no problem getting an audience, it seems to me, when you talk about nature, because we're so disconnected. So, so where does the disconnect happen? Because I speak to artists um, and artists kind of slash activists who want to talk about climate change, who want to talk, well, let's, let's not even say deforestation, because it's all related, who just want to talk about climate change. And they want to do it in an engaging way. They want to do it in a way that won't make people tune out won't make people put their heads over their ears. It might actually make them do something. Yeah. Any, any, well, any advice or. Well, the advice is just to go back to some very simple truths that we have forgotten, but that indigenous people know to their very core. They speak of mother earth. They speak of being created from the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. They speak of other species of plants and animals as their relatives now, if you look at the world that way, believe me, it shapes the way you act. If you understand so profoundly, if you don't have air for three minutes, and that air is created by all of the plants. Before there were plants, there was no oxygen in the air, because oxygen is a very reactive, reactive element. And when oxygen appears, it rusts things, it oxidizes things and disappears. <clears throat> it's just because so many plants took over the planet that over time, over millions of years, they created about 19 to 20% of the air is oxygen. If all plants die out, believe me, it will be an unlivable planet for an animal like us because the oxygen will very rapidly disappear. We need plants to keep the, the planet habitable. The soil that we grow our food in is created by life. You know, without, without life, there would be no soil. That's why Matt Damon stranded on Mars. Remember, he had a year's worth of potatoes, but he only, but he, he had to wait four years to get rescued. How do you convert four years worth of potatoes into four years worth of potatoes? There's no soil. So he had to dig a hole in the, in the, in the dust and, and uh, uh, the clay and gravel or, uh, and uh, sand. And then he had to put poop into it to add that creation of life in order to grow his, his, uh, his potatoes. When you understand the earth literally creates us by giving us the air, the water, the soil, the food, the, the clean energy, then you realize, oh my goodness, we can't use the earth as a garbage can the way we have. It seems to me it's as simple as that. Yeah, it, Without air, we die in three minutes. Yeah, it, if we it, have to breathe polluted air, we sicken. That's why over 7 million people around the world die every year. And that number is skyrocketing now from air pollution because we're using air as a garbage can. It, 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 what do we expect? It, it, and that's going to continue to increase. It, it reminds me of when we talk about... In, I've always had a little bit of an issue when people talk envi about environmentalism or environmental issues. It's like... The, it's not another thing. Like it's it's not another thing. It's not a separate. It's not like a car or a dog. It's it's everything. Exactly. You know you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. That's we we act as if the environment is out there. Indeed, when I started uh, my my career in in the environment issue, that's 1962. I thought of it as the environment's out there. We're here. We've just got to regulate that the way we interact. In 1962, there was no environment department in any government on the planet. So, you know, I was saying we need more environment departments. We need more laws. We need to regulate and enforce the laws. But what indigenous people taught me, and that's when we did a show with on, on the fight over logging in British Columbia, 1980, 80, they said, there is no environment out there for God's sakes. It's in us, it's, we are the environment. It's as much a part of us as, as anything. And that, that I think is what we have to, to realize. If we keep thinking of ourselves as separate, then it's as if 
there's no consequence of dealing with that as something different from us. And, you know, we're getting us into a pickle where the, the problem is so great now with climate and species extinction that we're going to think, well, we've got to take it all over and we've got to, you know, geoengineer the planet. That is, we're, we're going to find the solutions, you know, we're going to spray particles in the atmosphere that will deflect light from the sun so it'll to help cool the earth or we're going to take the emissions and pump it into the ground and hope it'll stay down there. We think we're so smart, but we've created this enormous problem and we're not going to be able, because we're not, we're not smart enough, we're not going to be able to engineer our way out of it. David, well, maybe this answers the question. You're 85 now? Afraid so. No chance of slowing down, I can tell, in terms of getting this out there can't it's my job you know i feel that this is the most important period of my life i mean whatever happens in the next few years if i survive that long really a very little effect on me but i feel that at this moment i've lived an entire life god damn it i have learned a lot every elder who survived into elderhood they have had experiences they have learned, they have watched, they have seen things happen. Damn it, we've got a job now to sift through the life for those experiences that are worth passing on to our children and grandchildren so that they don't repeat the same mistakes that, that we've made, that they will take advantage of the things that we saw as real opportunities. So elders, I think, at this stage, this is the most important, the most exciting period of my life. And I'll tell you what COVID has taught me is that most of the people who have died from the virus are old people. And most of the ones that died were hived away in long-term care homes, for-profit care homes, where pro when profit comes before everything else, you know they cut corners, most of the elders who died, died under conditions they shouldn't, they shouldn't have been living under. Isolated, alone, and uh, with little involvement with other people. I think the tragedy of the COVID crisis has been the, those people who should be the most respected, the most revered people in society, the people who have so much to contribute to us that they died the way they did. That is really tragic. I hope when we emerge from this, that we will begin to change the way that we treat our, our elders in a way that takes advantage of what they have learned over a lifetime. A, 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 a good ending, uh, given that this is a Lifetime Achievement Award, which normally comes with the end of the career, being able to sit back and relax and look back. And nothing gives me greater joy than to know that you have no intention of doing that. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for the the respectful interview, but thanks so much for having me on Q. As you know, I'm a big fan of Q, so thank you very much. I'm a big fan of yours too, David, and uh, I'll hopefully see you around someday though. I don't think I don't think you're getting on the plane anytime soon. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> David Suzuki has been the host of CBC's The Nature of Things since 1979. You can stream that show on CBC's Jam. He also has a new podcast called The David Suzuki Podcast through his David Suzuki Foundation. And tomorrow he'll be receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Canadian Screen Awards. <laughs>